You might not expect that a Buckeye who graduated with degrees in anthropology and Spanish became a nurse at the Southern Ohio Medical Center, but that is the journey of our next speaker. He's here to share an intimate experience from the height of the pandemic. Let's welcome Seth Lemons. So I decided to present my story in a slightly different style. One might say that I am a little bit of a rebel, and maybe that's just my imagination, but I hope it resonates. Growing up in rural Ohio, I was always too something. Too shy, too quiet, too queer, too thin, and eventually too sad, too broken. I hid from those twos by shielding myself away from the world, lying, barricading, digging tunnels within myself so deep that even I couldn't find my way out. About a decade or so passed and I found myself at the end of a wayward path, a relatively new nurse working in an ICU, overwhelmed by the death and the suffering that I was seeing every shift. The pandemic took a long time to reach us in rural Ohio. I live in an area that most people overlook a news story that is soon forgotten, a rest stop on the way to your real destination. But COVID finally found us, the virus that was not real and wave after wave, we lost families and friends and coworkers and countless patients. One night around Christmas, Snow was falling outside the hospital windows and a man I did not know decided that his BiPAP was just too much. Intubation was not what he wanted and comfort was all that he was after. Now every person who has ever put on a BiPAP hates it. It is like driving down the highway with your head stuck outside the window. It is like a hurricane hitting you in the face. But for most of our patients during those long COVID shifts, we could not honor their pleas to just take off the mask. COVID causes the oxygen in your blood to drop the carbon dioxide to raise, progressively starving your brain of everything that it needs until eventually you just succumb to cloudiness and confusion and you just become unresponsive. Most of our patients had come to us past the point of mental clarity. They had no choice in their fate. And so we forced their hands away from their mask, tying their arms down. And when things got worse, we intubated, paralyzed, and prone them, watched as days turned to weeks and broken lungs would not heal. We watched as families gave up hope and eventually we removed care. We couldn't let this happen to him. So we scrambled, we called his wife who at this time was stuck at home. The world was quarantined and we only allowed visitors for the dying. We asked if she would come be with her husband as he passed, she called family and friends trying desperately to find a ride, but the snow was still falling. The roads were unplowed and she could not get her car down the street. So we put her on FaceTime. We held the phone underneath his downturned eyes and watched as she said goodbye to her husband. She could barely get the words out. Over strangled sobs, she said that it would be okay, that she would be okay. We listened as he struggled to choke out something, anything, his weak voice barely audible over the gusts of blowing air. 
only able to say a few words before needing to pause to rest. A tense jaw under salt and pepper stubble. What can you say at the end? How can you give justice to a life together through space and snow and the screen of a phone? The goodbyes faded away. We gave him medication to ease his anxiety and I helped him take off his mask and I held him. I sat on his bed and held his hands in mine. This man I did not know. He asked me if he would feel himself suffocate. And I told him that I would make this okay. Leaving unsaid that I really did not know. Minutes went by. The BiPAP had ruffled his gray speckled hair. I finger combed the stray pieces away from his face, he did not notice. His breaths heavy in his chest, they turned to gasps and then gulps and then finally nothing. And still I held his hands in my own, this man I did not know but whose face I found so familiar because on his face I saw suffering and loneliness and a feeling that this world just isn't fair. But underneath my own sadness, I felt purpose. The twos that had lingered from my childhood, the sadness, the broken pieces, the tangled journey that had led me to this hospital room, they were all finally starting to piece themselves together. They were all finally starting to mean something more. They had given me a way to look past the surface, past the clock and the medications and the hospital and the news and to see another person suffering. And instead of bowing out, these twos had given me the strength to sit with this man, to sit with this stranger, to hold his hands in my own and to be what he needed in this moment. Now the strength this strength is inside all of us. It is universal. This strength is innate, yet so few of us choose to use it. When all it takes is an understanding look shared between strangers, we fear it. When all it takes is a look, we look away. When you refuse to look away from sadness, you might just see the joy hiding within. Life doesn't last and it's not supposed to. It flickers away and when it does, it is terrifying and there are tears, but there is joy. Joy in a life lived, joy in love and joy in being a part of something so much bigger than ourselves. And there is hope and possibility and the opportunity to take our collective pain and wield it, to take our twos and embrace them, to use them to change ourselves for the better, to use this strength to see sadness in a stranger's face, to take their hands in our own and to know how to guide them towards joy. Thank you.